Okay, thank you everyone and thanks for the invitation to speak here today. It's a, actually a great honor. So I'm an assistant professor in pathology at the University of Washington. I just opened the doors to my laboratory in July, so we're still in the beginning phases, but it's such a great community. And I'm just working across the street um, at the Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine. And my lab is focusing on modeling mainly the late onset sporadic form of Alzheimer's disease, primarily using human-induced pluripotent stem cells. So that's what I'll talk to you about today. And just for a very brief background, I know everybody is familiar with Alzheimer's disease and probably there are several of you in this audience who are directly affected by it um, in your families because AD is extremely common. <clears throat> and as of this year, there's over 5 million Americans affected and this number is simply predicted to increase because the biggest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is aging. We also know that it's very expensive. So uh, AD costs over $2 billion in healthcare this doesn't really even take into account the money lost by caregivers who have to leave their jobs or to take care of affected um, loved ones. But I think for those of us who are interested in biomedical research, the really devastating part of AD is that despite now several decades of studying and a lot of insight into the mechanisms, there's no, currently no treatment that alters the progression of this disease. And the statistics are just not very good. So in this study, over a 12-year period, AD has an almost 100% failure rate in clinical trials. And as of just a week and a half ago, this doesn't seem to be improving as yet another drug failed in phase three. So all people are still trying. Um, the company Biogen has a new drug that's just entering phase three trials right now. But most of these, drugs that are failing are targeting sort of the same type of disease mechanism in AD. And so what we're hoping is that by studying human cells and human neurons derived from these cells, which I'll tell you about how we're making, we can start to investigate potentially new pathways that may lead us to some new insights in how to design novel drugs. So at the pathological level, I'll talk about two cellular phenotypes that are most consistently associated with Alzheimer's disease. The accumulation of these misfolded and often toxic proteins, amyloid beta, which is an extracellular accumulation. It's a cleavage product of a multifunctional protein called amyloid precursor protein, or APP, and the intracellular tangles of a protein, neuronal protein called tau, which is a microtubule associated protein which becomes hyperphosphorylated and dysfunctional, leading to loss of trafficking down the neuronal axon, loss of synapses and neurons. And although these pictures often show this to be a very neuronal centric focused process, we have to understand that these processes affect all the types of the central nervous system, including not only neurons, but astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and microglial cells. And one of the biggest issues, I think, with AD work right now is that despite good models for rare forms of AD called familial AD, where there's a clear deterministic mutation, there's a real lack of accurate models for the late onset, much more common sporadic form, where there is no clear inheritance pattern. And this is obviously due to the complexity of the disease, including there's complex genetic and environmental interactions, which we don't understand. Despite the fact of no deterministic mutation, there's a clear hereditary component. And so we have to con consider the contribution of moderately penetrant, moderately to even lowly penetrant risk alleles. And I'll talk a little bit more about this as I, as I go on. So in general, for the outline of my talk and what I'm focusing on in my laboratory is to understand human genetic variation in Alzheimer's disease, primarily using iPS cells as a model system which is very powerful because we can take a population of people either with disease or without and essentially capture their genetic background in the dish, create a pluripotent stem cell line, and then differentiate into a relevant cell type. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to tell you two very brief stories about how um, some Alzheimer's disease risk factors I think are implicating the endosomal network and asking how this could potentially be a new therapeutic target for AD. And then I'll just briefly touch at the end on one of the new projects we're starting in the lab to develop a robust stem cell model from AD from actual patient samples from the Seattle area Alzheimer's Center. <clears throat> 
Okay, so a lot of the common variants that are associated with AD risk are identified through genome-wide association studies. And these are common and very low penetrant variants. So you can imagine that in general, the risk in a population is small, but if you think about it, it could be much different on the level of an individual. So I like to think of this in two models. So if you have model one with two patients with different genetic backgrounds as de denoted by these two different colors, and let's say they each have an individual risk of about 10% of developing a disease such as Alzheimer's disease, you can consider their, their average risk in a population would be 10%. But you can also consider a model of two different genetic backgrounds where the average risk in a population is still the same, about 10%, but this individual may have a much higher complement of risk variants. And if we could generate a disease-relevant cell type, such as a neuron from this patient, maybe we would see a cellular phenotype. And more importantly, maybe cells, or the, maybe these patients would respond differently to different drugs that you would test in a clinical trial. So in terms of AD risk factors, there's always a long list of about 20 or so loci that have been consistently associated with AD throughout uh, genome-wide association studies as they become more popular. And it always looks to me like a laundry list, and we don't know the function of all of them, but what is striking is that fully a quarter of these genes function in the biological pathway of vesicular trafficking and endocytosis. But to my knowledge, there's not yet a therapeutic target that's specifically working on this pathway or targeting this network. And we know from other older studies that look at cell biology that the endocytic network is involved in Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis. So, up to a decade and a half ago, people were documenting these enlarged endocytic structures in neurons from post-mortem sporadic AD samples. And this has actually been recapitulated in stem cell-derived neurons from patients with Alzheimer's disease. We also know that this pivotal molecule, the amyloid precursor protein, is actually trafficked and processed through the endosomal network and that the potentially toxic amyloid beta is generated probably in late endosomes. So there's a lot of factors that regulate this. I'm going to talk about two of them for my work today, a family in a, a protein in a family of um, receptors called the VPS10 receptors. The gene is SORL1, the protein is SORLA. SORLA works to traffic molecules from the endosome to the Golgi. And also a large multi-protein complex called the retromer, which also functions along with SORLA to do this sort of retrograde trafficking of different um, cellular cargo. So I, was, I first started working on SORLA as a postdoctoral fellow in Larry Goldstein's lab at UCSD, and I always found this gene to be very interested, interesting as a, what I called a candidate gene with biological relevance. So SORLA has been identified in multiple GWAS studies spanning now seven um, to eight years of having different genetic variants consistently associated with AD. But even much earlier, when people looked in SAD patient tissue or uh, lymphoblast lines, there was a loss that could show a loss of SORL1 expression. And if you look at this little cartoon, sort of the dogma of how this protein works is that it binds to the amyloid precursor and due to its role in shuttling it through the endosomal network back to the Golgi can prevent these cleavage events that cause the amyloid beta peptide to be produced and accumulated. So when I was at UCSD, we worked with the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center there to collect fibroblast samples from patients uh, that had sporadic AD or were age-matched controls. We ended up with 22 fibroblast samples, and we also ended up with fibroblasts from Craig Venter. And I always get varying responses to this because everyone sort of has an opinion on Craig Venter. Um, and we didn't take his fibroblast just because he was famous or he was starting his own institute in La Jolla at the time and he wanted to give us his cells. We took his cells because he had the first diploid sequence of his genome. And among other things, including predispositions to various substance addictions and risk-taking activities, he has several um, SNPs and he's homozygous for several variants that are associated with increased Alzheimer's disease risk. So you can imagine he was very interested in having us work on his cells. So this turned out to be a great control. We were interested in these genes. We knew what the risk genotype should look like as we genotyped our samples. 
And when we looked in our patient samples, we found eight with the same genotype as Craig Venter. This, I'm calling it CGC. And what I don't really have time to explain is that these SNPs actually mark a large haplotype. So it's not just three SNPs all together, but all of these SNPs mark about a 50 KB region of DNA. Um, there were seven with the other genotype, which was associated with less Alzheimer's disease risk, so we called that protective, and then seven heterozygotes. And now the sample size was much too small, of course, to make any type of conclusions, but what was encouraging is that if we compared our little fibroblast data set and we saw very strong evidence of linkage disequilibrium in one of the haplotypes, and then we analyzed a larger population set, such as the Thousand Genomes Project, which had a demographic similar to the patients we were getting samples from, we saw a very similar pattern in association. So this was encouraging that our albeit small population of diseased or controlled cells were indicative of a, larger, of a larger population. So from these cells, we reprogrammed 13. We ended up with seven probable sporadic ADs and six controls, and we focused our studies looking at the five prime end, this risk haplotype here in the SORL1 gene. And so we did this by generating neurons from iPS cells. We took a very uh, traditional approach using the four Yamanaka factors to reprogram the fibroblasts. We drove these cells to neural ectoderm lineage and were able to generate a neural progenitor population utilizing a strategy of, of fluorescence-activated cell sorting to pull out a cell surface signature that would allow us to have a renewable population of what we term neural progenitor cells. And from those, we could do a further directed differentiation down a neuronal lineage yielding a very highly positive MAP2 population that are also CTIP2 positive, suggesting they're going down a more cortical neuron lineage. And again, we were able to purify these cells using a cell sorting strategy for cell surface markers, and that these purified cells could actually be grown in culture for um, up to two weeks or even longer if we used conditioned medium from uh, cell astrocytic cells. Now, as with any protocol, this has its pros and cons. This is a very consistent protocol. Um, the neurons have a, we get a consistent percentage out. They have the same morphology. Um, purified cells can simplify biochemistry when you're looking at, trying to look at neuron-specific uh, phenotypes, such as amyloid beta or tau. And of course, as with a lot of stem cell work, we still need to work on defining our neuronal subtypes and working on making our cultures more mature. So these are some other projects that I'm, I'm starting to look at in my own laboratory. But for the purposes of this project, we had these neurons and we wanted to test a, a fairly straightforward hypothesis, which would be that there were risk variants we knew in the SORL1 gene and there was decreased expression in postmortem samples. So we hypothesized that these risk variants would somehow lead to this expression loss. This would increase the amyloid beta, the toxic protein in AD, and that would lead to disease. And this work is published, so I'm going to just go through it in a, in a cartoon format, but I'm happy to discuss more um, about it throughout the day. But what we found was that rather than being ex exactly this straightforward, it actually was dependent on a cell signaling event. And this was interesting because this was something we could really only test using living human neurons, and that it depended on the addition of a neurotrophic factor, BDNF. And what we found was that all of the patient cell lines that harbored at least one protective allele had an increase in SORL1 expression after treatment with BDNF whether all of the patients who were homozygous for the risk allele had no change in expression. So this did not affect the basal expression levels of SORL1 gene. They were not necessarily lower in these patients or these patients or higher in these patients, but it changed the way the gene expression was induced. And then when we looked at the cellular phenotype, amyloid beta, we could see that upon this certain treatment, we had a decrease in A beta with those with a protective allele and no change or even a slight increase in patients with the risk alleles. And so we changed our hypothesis to suggest that these risk variants actually in living human neurons change the expression induction of this gene, which alters A beta, and this increases disease risk. We felt that at the end, this was more consistent with a process that would increase disease risk, yet not be deterministic, a deterministic mutation. And so we developed a model, which I, I summarized here, 
where these phenotypes are consistent with disease risk. And what I think is really important is that we could use this system to identify which patients might be appropriate for certain clinical trials. Um, as you could imagine, the patients here that did not respond to BDNF might not be great placed in a trial where BDNF was a, a primary uh, drug. But what data I didn't show you is that we could use another factor, cyclic AMP, um, to lower, that induce SORL1 across the board and reduce uh, A beta in all of our samples. And so this actually was very productive because we're now working with the company Biogen to investigate this as a therapeutic target, um, primarily using iPS cells. And I think I have, I need to start question and answer now. Okay, so I don't get to tell you about my other story. So I'm happy to talk about it. Basically, we were able to take a new drug to target the endosomal network and test it in our iPS cells. So I will skip that part, but I'm happy to talk about that uh, down the road. And I think, and we also did a lot of uh, genome editing in that project. So I'll just suffice it to say that I think that using stem cells, we have a and genome editing, which I know is a big focus of the Cell Science Institute, we have a great way to not only look at the cell biology of a neuron, but to introduce specific variants um, in cells using genome editing and then look at that in patient-derived cells. The last thing I'm going to tell you is a project that we're starting with the um, ADRC here, in particular with Dirk Keen, who runs the Neuropathology Corps. And he's collecting the leptin meninges, which is the protective layer around the brain, and he do is doing this on autopsy. So we're actually going to reprogram autopsy-confirmed Alzheimer's disease because that's truly the only di confirmed diagnosis of AD is upon autopsy. So we can grow these leptin meningeal cells, and we've actually reprogrammed our first two lines um, over at Ice Cream in the last couple of months. So we're hoping this will become a great resource, not only for the AD community, but for the cell biology community as well. And with that, I would just finish and acknowledge my previous work at UCSD and my current affiliations with pathology and ice cream. Thank you. Probably have time for one, we probably have time for one question. Thank you. That was very interesting. The, the early on, you had a picture that contrasted two hypotheses about the um, variance of the associated with the risk in the population. Mm -hmm. uh, I have, there's probably an easy answer to this, but is it possible to uh, assay that empirically by looking at patterns of uh, disease in across families? And if so, what is the evidence for it being highly uh, high variance versus low? Yeah. So. You could certainly lo look at the incidence of variants across families. The thing with these common variants is they have a very low effect size, so the odds ratios are like 1.1 and 1.2. So it's hard to really know how much within a, in a small family they would cause risk. But they're pointing to certain loci. So now what people are doing is taking these loci that are identified by GWAS forgetting kind of about the common variants, but then doing deeper sequencing to look for more rare variants that may actually uh, elucidate a little bit more about some of the hereditary within a hereditary uh, inheritance within a family. So, yeah. Okay, let's thank Jessica again, and I'm going to welcome.